Uh, hello. Thank hello. You. Hi. Thank you for being here with us and you're watching a new episode of uh, Learn from the Greeks, West Coast edition. And uh, today our guest is Dr. Eva Primas from Stanford University. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be with you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And um, I would like to start by telling our audience that um, you had some great news today, first thing in the morning. Uh, we had already planned our interview many days ahead. And today uh, you received some great news that uh, you are um, nominated and shortlisted uh, for the category of social sciences for uh, the Greek International Women's Award, GIWA. Yes, yes, indeed. And I am uh, um, very happy about that. It was great news this morning. What a coincidence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this, yes, this is uh, an award for uh, Greek women internationally. And um, it's uh, awarded for excellence in your, in your field in general and your activities. So it's a great pleasure and an honor to be nominated, especially shortlisted. Yeah, congratulations for that. Thank you. Thank and I wish you all the best uh, to win the final prize. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll see. There are various steps and there are um, three, I think three or four steps. First, they go through uh, judges and after they give their opinion, they go to another. Uh, step with more judges, and then I think uh, the vote goes to the public. So the shortlisted uh, means uh, the vote is going now to the public. So it's all on us, on our hands. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Wish you all the best. Wish you all the best. And uh, the, the procedure lasts for a month, I think, 1st of February to 1st of March. Yes, uh, the public can vote between February 1st and uh, March 1st. Thank you. Thank you. So to continue our uh, interview today, please uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself. I'll be happy to. Um, I originally come from Athens, Greece. I was born in Athens and uh, I, that's where I studied. I spent my youth years. I went to college to the University of Athens, Kapodistrian University in the School of Philosophy, Philosophy Kishwali. And after that, I came to the States, I came to Stanford University to pursue my um, graduate degree. And I finished my PhD in the School of Education at Stanford. And since then, I stayed at Stanford where I am still today teaching and uh, um, doing uh, work there and um, having the pleasure to meet so many uh, so wonderful students, and some of them are of Greek heritage. At Stanford, I teach Greek literature, culture, and language, but I also direct a program of languages, uh, languages that are less commonly taught. And that means that these languages are not widely taught in all universities in uh, the US or the world. And uh, of course, these are languages that are representing and they are uh, spoken by so many millions. Some of these languages are very, very um, uh, unusual, rare languages. Sometimes people don't even recognize the names, but at Stanford, um, we have a program that addresses the need and uh, tailors to those students who create uh, their own studies sometimes or who are involved with research and they have to study a particular language and they are involved with the geography of the area. So uh, at this point, we have about, in my program alone, about 20 to 23 languages per year. And uh, I supervise the instructors, the lecturers who teach these languages. We create, I help them create curriculum, we design the program, 
um, I have help for that and uh, I am involved with assessing the students, assessing the program and creating uh, new initiatives and uh, moving on with um, best practices and what is the latest in the field of uh, language teaching. So I have the pleasure to work with a lot of people from various ethnic backgrounds and also the students who are taking uh, our languages and literature. So in every um, aspect of my uh, work, I have to come and to be involved with uh, many different ethnicities. I also supervise uh, Fulbrights and uh, we have created a program um, in the past that uh, oriented Fulbright scholars and uh, prepared them for teaching languages in the United States for a certain period. So my involvement uh, with the field for many years uh, has made me aware of uh, uh, not only difficulties in language teaching, but also ways to approach a better understanding among people and among people from different cultures. It has been very rewarding. You're a multifaceted personality. <laughs> I have to say. Thank and you. So uh, my next question is going to be about COVID-19 and uh, how has it affected the uh, Stanford University? If you have any best practices to share with us? Yes, um, COVID has been so abruptly intervening in what we do uh, on campus. The whole population is on campus. Activities are on campus. Uh, young people eat together, they live in dorms. And all of a sudden this had to change. And with that, we changed our programs, we changed policies. It was a huge change. We had to go through a lot of training on approaching teaching online in a way that would be supportive and uh, correct for our students, but not only for the students, for the instructors also. Mm -hmm. So uh, since March last year, uh, we had to go through a lot of changes, a lot of training. And uh, of course, the health guidelines change all the time, therefore, we have to be able to adjust ourselves. Uh, the, the most important is that we have to create community online. That's not an easy thing to do, to have everybody communicate well, uh, to be available, to be um, understanding what the program is about and not to lower our standards. So there has been changes. However, I should say that there were very positive things along with that. And uh, we had situations where students uh, had to go home in Hong Kong, in Asia, or to go to Europe. And it has been very hard to communicate because of uh, uh, differences in time and other things. Uh, but I have to say that everybody has been terrific in supporting each other, in understanding and in being willing to create community. So uh, it's not only how to teach online and what to teach and what kind of policies to secure, but also how to create community and how to, to think of someone who participates and is there for each other. And uh, since everything takes place online, do you notice more interaction with the uh, audience from Greece? Yes, yes, definitely. Actually, that has been enhanced. It's easier in a way to communicate with uh, colleagues from Greece, universities. I offer um, professional development programs and it's easier to communicate with colleagues in Greece of online. I am also a member of the board at the uh, High Council 
that has been created by uh, Archbishop Elpidophoros. And we have created a lot of uh, programs. We communicate with colleagues from Greece, universities, uh, the um, uh, Minister of Education has joined and other uh, notables. And uh, it's been uh, a fantastic thing to see this international community developing. So um, besides your very successful academic career, uh, you are uh, the founder and the president of uh, two organizations. Uh, the first one is uh, the Greek American Professional Women's Society. And the second is the American Association of Teachers uh, of Modern Greek. So Thank you for mentioning that because uh, these are two initiatives that um, I'm really uh, involved and I love and uh, I have been very fortunate to be able to accomplish. Uh, and believe me, this is not an individual's effort. This is an effort of a team, of a group, of a lot of people who are willing to put the work. And uh, uh, for the first association, the uh, Greek American Women's Professional Women's Association. Um, I want to say that this is an organization by women for women, and uh, we have wonderful initiatives. We have um, panels, we bring lecturers, we uh, uh, a lot of uh, people who are specialists in certain fields that we are interested in. And uh, we also create a network to support each other. We mentor young women uh, here in the States or women who come from Greece and they start a career here or a life here. And we are supporting them wholeheartedly. Plus we have created uh, two scholarships for young um, uh, Greek American girls, women, who are uh, college undergraduates. And every year we offer uh, two scholarships, $1,000 per scholarship. And the girls that, uh, the, the kids that receive the scholarships are outstanding. They are fantastic people, motivated, excellent academically, and they love their heritage. So it's really a pleasure to be involved in that organization for me uh, one more reason beyond all that, I truly believe that women are the backbone of the family. They keep the rituals, they keep communicating with the bigger family, they nurture children. So women need to come together and when they come together, they create wonderful things. And I want to uh, say a few things also about the other organization. The American Association of Teachers of, yeah, of Teachers of Modern Greek, which uh, basically fulfills a need that has been there for a long time. There are, as you know, there are community schools that teach Greek affiliated with our churches and uh, parishions uh, and parishioners. So, uh, the mostly the teachers are working after hours and they are having maybe themselves kids who attend Greek school and they are there to learn about the language and the culture. So the American Association of Teachers of Modern Greek is a network that supports all teachers. We have um, 10, about 10, 11 uh, schools in California, Seattle and Portland and we are all working together. It's a great community. Uh, if I count students out of all these schools, I would say we serve more than 500 students of Greek uh, heritage who are learning the language. Uh, and I want to say that um, it started very small with just an idea that I had. I do a lot of professional development academically so I thought I would do that for my community. And uh, it has been now for several years going on. And it's something that I treasure. And um, 
I want to mention one initiative that it is very appropriate, especially this year, we are launching a new program, uh, which is dedicated to children ages 11, 10 to 16. And it brings to the Greek community school the idea of bridging uh, the past with the present. The program is called After School Archaeology and Cultural Heritage. It's a program at the moment online. We are working on it and we are doing, uh, we are having the pilot, which is going to be launched in April. And um, we will expand, of course. We were very fortunate to receive a grant from the Society of Classical Studies. Uh, and they loved our project, so we are very excited. Uh, we are hoping that our culture through that program will be enhanced and uh, will be something that the children will love. In the schools, we don't teach archaeology. We don't teach a lot of things that older children, older students learn at the college level. So we wanted to bring a program that makes sense for younger kids. And it is uh, geared to their ages. We have uh, in our team archeologists, archeologists. Uh, we have people who design curriculum. We have technical support. So we are hoping that what we are going to create will, will be something uh, innovative and uh, something that not only uh, Greek communities, but also other ethnic communities will embrace. Uh, thank you for sharing with us this initiative and for promoting the Greek uh, culture and archaeology and all your excellent work that you're doing. Um, and probably this is a good way for an American who wants to learn the Greek language. Would you? I guess that this is a good way yes. to do. Very, yes, uh, the program actually has aspects that are bilingual. Yes. And we are hoping that uh, beyond culture, it will also give the opportunity for people to enhance their language abilities. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and uh, as uh, you know, we celebrate as Greeks, we celebrate the International Greek Language Day on February 9th every year. Yes. Uh, do you uh, plan any events? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, actually, um, recently we have been working on that aspect, knowing not only about the Greek Language Day, which is, uh, I think, February 9, but also because of our uh, big celebration of the good, uh, 200 years of independence. We have been uh, designing and creating a lot of activities that will be implemented by our schools, and uh, the schools will, will create websites with the children's work and also share that with the parents and the community. Uh, on uh, February 7, we will meet, we'll meet uh, every quarter, academic quarter, and we have webinars, seminars, and this particular um, webinar that uh, we'll have on February 7, it, it is about culture and how to integrate the teaching of culture in the language class. So uh, we'll have actually our uh, consul general from San Francisco consulate visiting us to give a greeting and we are preparing activities that will be accomplished uh, and uh, implemented uh, via the schools and then displayed uh, so that our community have access to them. And you mentioned uh, the 200 years that we celebrate this yes. year since the Greek Revolution in 1821. Uh, could you please uh, let us know any projects that Stanford uh, is planning? Yes, yes. As a matter of fact, we have been working now for quite some time, and it's not um, just a Stanford effort, it's a California effort. 
we are collaborating uh, the San Francisco, the Sacramento State University, Berkeley University, UCLA, and Stanford. And we have been organizing a symposium with excellent uh, visitors from Greece, scholars, academics, who are going to talk. And we are hoping it will be uh, real time and uh, live uh, in on campuses, but we'll see how things go with COVID. But we have an excellent program. It's a program that starts with uh, an evening of celebration in Sacramento and then moves on to Berkeley for the whole day for uh, panels and uh, lectures. Then the next day to Stanford and it ends up at UCLA with a beautiful performance. So we're very excited. This is a project that has taken a, a long time and a lot of uh, collaboration and communication, but we are thrilled that we are able to have that and also to bring it to our community. It's open to our communities. And fingers crossed, because as far as I know, this project is gonna take place uh, end of uh, this year. So yes, in, in, in November. Mm -hmm. So uh, early, yes, early November, yeah. So we, we, help plan, us. <laughs> we plan on having it as late as possible so that we can do it uh, on campus, but we'll see how things go. Yeah, fingers crossed for that because it will be an amazing experience and yes, different yes. Uh, academic environments and reputable yes. academic environments. And, and the speakers are fantastic, you know. And also the, the performance in UCLA, uh, the Macriani Unplugged, I think. Yes, absolutely, yes. We are looking forward to all that. Uh, in a more personal note, mm -hmm. um, I would like to ask you, uh, what is your current interaction with Greece? And uh, yeah. I have family in Greece, so. Uh, you go often? Before yes. COVID? Yes, before COVID every summer and sometimes twice a year, mostly summers. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, my family is there, my husband has family there, and um, we always take our family and we spend the summers. So there is a lot of uh, communication, interaction, not only with family, but also professionally. Uh, both uh, my husband and I have professional ties. I have been working with the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Culture, um, the University of Patras in the past. And, you know, I have ties that I really uh, treasure and I'm looking forward to going to Greece every summer, definitely. Do you have um, any experience or a particular experience or a hobby that uh, you enjoy in Greece and you miss when you're in San Francisco or you can't find in California in general? <laughs> Uh, there is a lot of things that I miss. I miss swimming. Yeah. <laughs> Here's the ocean. <laughs> the ocean. I miss, I miss everything. I miss the different uh, corners, corners, regions of Greece that are unique in their own ways. And if I want to be very particular, I miss the summer theater, summer movie theaters, the Therino Cinema, my favorite activity. I love uh, movies, uh, but um, this is more than going to the movies. This is a cultural experience that cannot be replicated. And uh, um, I think people should not really miss it. Uh, the uh, the Greek cinema has really changed a lot. And now is uh, from what I know, I understand there are movies competing internationally. Uh, I was reading the other day about the movie Apples. Correct, bro. Yes, yes. That's and done really well. Right, we have notable people in uh, films and documentaries. But as I said, beyond that, how can you pass this experience being under the Greek sky in the evening, carefree, 
and uh, watching your favorite movie. I don't think you can pass that. Yeah, I mean, I'm Greek and uh, I totally understand and I have the emails in my head when you say yeah. yes. summer movie in Greece in the Greek cinema open there. Yes, absolutely. In California, I think something no, yeah. in, in the drive -in cinemas probably. I mean, but you're inside the, the car, it's not. Uh, not this, not at all. No, not no. at all. And I, I think um, it's just, you know, the smell in the air. That's the judgments. Usually a um, movie theater in Greece is in a backyard of a uh, building or outdoors. And uh, you have all these uh, unique things happening. And uh, I still have in my mind a lot of uh, pictures you know, me going with my parents as a child and then as a young adult and spending time in the evening outdoors with friends and discussing the film and talking. And it's, it's a cultural thing. thing. It's a cultural thing, yeah. Typical. It's a cultural event, absolutely. Uh, it's not uh, something that people uh, should miss. If they are in Greece, I think it would be a great experience to bring the family to the movies. Um, would you, do you have any particular Greek word that you, be, better describes for you Greece? Greece? I thought you said Greek word about me. If it were about me, my favorite word is Meraki. Ah. Good. That's my favorite word. Um, I've heard a lot about Kefi. Meraki is another mm. good one, yeah. No, I prefer Meraki. Mm -hmm. Kefi, of course, a combination would be terrific. Uh, Meraki is more than passion. If you have Meraki, then you are off to fantastic things. Of course, there are other parameters, but Meraki is essential. As far as the word about Greece, um, well, I can say that when you think about Greece, it's magic. You want to be there. You want to be on land, on Greece, in the ocean, any anywhere that Greece uh, is, you know, you're, you're surrounded by so many fantastic experiences. And I don't mean historically, I mean, Greece has so much to offer and um, it's magic, as I mentioned, that would be the word that I would go with, magic. Literally, the way you des you, your descriptions are about Greece, I mean, I, right now with my head, I'm already there. <laughs> I really feel it. I understand. I'm with you. Uh, hopefully, we will have a chance to, to go back soon. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. We're getting ready as soon as COVID is mm -hmm. over. Soon. We can travel, I'm sure, and I, I think I... Um, I'm speaking on behalf of many uh, Greeks and Greek Americans, of course, will be there. So, uh, Dr. Eva Prionas, I'm really, I would like, I'm grateful and thank you for being here with us today and sharing these wonderful news and experiences. And, uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And all to all of you, stay tuned for our next episode. Bye. Bye.